Hi, welcome to the Big Bear Homestead. And today is episode two in the Predator Control series. So today, we're talking coons. Okay, so last week on Predator Control on the Homestead, we covered possums. Now, there are a lot of similarities with possums and raccoons. So what I want you to do is if you missed that one, stop. Click right here. Go back, watch that video, and then come back to this one. Because the things that they're similar in, we're not going to cover again, and we're not going to be redundant in this video. And it's going to be th important things like dispatching, um, deterrence. Most of the traps, even though we're going to add a new trap in this series, but the coon cuff and the cage and the foothold, we're not going to go over again in this one like we did in the last one. So, if you've seen it, then let the camera play. If not, let's go back. Alright, so let's talk about the raccoon, a.k.a. the mask bandit. In order for you to be able to trap him, you got to know a little bit about it. So let's start off by learning about the raccoon. Alright, unlike last week's predator, the possum, the raccoon is rather intelligent. But he does have one major flaw, and that is curiosity. And you'll be able to use that against him. Now, the raccoons, they're very good climbers, and they're very good swimmers. And one of the reasons being is because their front paws are very dexterous. Which also gives them the ability to open up coops, trash cans, flip over stones. Because see, normally they're in small creeks or shallow water flipping over stones looking for crayfish and stuff like that. Now, raccoons do have territories. And depending upon the dominance level and the, and the size of the raccoon will dominate the size of his territory. But garden variety is the territory of a raccoon usually is anywhere from two to four miles. Now in the fall a raccoon will travel up to three to five miles looking for things to eat so that way it can store fat for the winter. So that brings us to our next subject. What does a raccoon eat? Okay so what does a raccoon eat? Well that's kind of a difficult question to answer because a raccoon is what they call an opportunistic hunter. Meaning, given the right opportunity, he'll eat just about anything. Now, his diet, some of the, his favorite things on his diet are things such as small fish, crayfish, clams, mussels, salamanders, small mammals, your chicks, small birds, eggs, fruits, nuts, grains, and really just about anything he can get his hands on. His favorite things are things like fish and corn. So, now that we know what a raccoon eats, how do we know if we got one? Okay, so how do we know we have a problem with raccoons? Well, we're going to tell you some tattletale signs that you can look for in order to determine whether or not you have a raccoon. The first sign is tracks. Always look for tracks. Now, raccoon tracks look like this. And yes, you're probably saying, Mr. Pig Bear, they look just like possum tracks. Well, they kind of do, but they're all, raccoon tracks are always larger than possum tracks. Number two, look for his scat, his feces, his dung, his poop. Look for that. Now, unlike the possum, the raccoon does care where he goes number two. He likes to go to a specific toilet area around there, if he can. Now, places to look for his feces are fallen trees, large logs that you have laying around. If you have a privacy fence, look across the top of that. This, right here, is what raccoon feces look like. Okay, number three, you've got dead chickens. Notice how chickens was plural. Unlike the possum, a raccoon will kill multiple chickens at one time. Now, the chickens will look similar to how a possum does it with the head gone and the chest cavity eaten out, but you'll have multiple 
chickens. Plus, not always, some of the times, the raccoon will pull them all over into one corner and eat, or he'll drag them a short distance from the coop. Number four, look at your coop, your area. Be very, very thorough in this inspection. And what I mean by that, a raccoon will have a definite tattletale entry area unless he can just climb up and over your chicken run. If you've got that somewhat blocked off, then he'll have a definite entry area. What I mean by that is look at your fencing. Is there a hole about the size of a basketball? Look at your coop itself, especially the roof. Again, it'll be about the hole the size of a basketball. You can't miss it. Sometimes, very rarely, but sometimes, you'll find a coon that likes to dig, and he will dig up and under. Okay, so now, you got it determined that you got a raccoon. How do you take care of it? Okay, so you know you got a coon problem. What do you do? Well, before we get into the traps, I want to briefly take a second and talk about deterrence. Now, you can put into play that three electric wire method that I discussed in the possum video in episode one. And it may and may not work for you. The bad thing about raccoons is, as I'm just being honest, I haven't found a deterrent yet that is 100% effective 100% of the time. So if you know you've got a raccoon problem, my suggestion is you go straight to traps. Okay, so let's talk traps for a second. The same traps that you used for the possum, you can use for the coon. Now, I'm not gonna go over these traps, traps in depth like I did for the possum video. If you missed that one, just please go back right here and check that video out. Now I am going to show you a nifty little trick that you have to do with the cage trap and then I'm going to introduce a new guy. Okay, let's go over that secret I was talking about with the cage traps. But let me caveat this with, I didn't grow, I didn't get all big gigantor on y'all. I'm using this smaller cage for instructional purposes only because shortly after we shot the possum video, guess what? We got a possum. And he was ended up being in an area that we couldn't use the coon cuff because there was no way to secure the coon cuff, so we had to put the cage into play. So for instructional pur purposes only, we're gonna use the small cage. Now, when it comes to a raccoon, you gotta outsmart him. And remember, they're rather intelligent. But all you need is this stick right here, just a small everyday stick. And what you have to do is in your cage, the square right before the pan, you slip this puppy in there. And the reason being is that the raccoon will not step on that stick. He'll step over it and then step on your paint. Because he doesn't want to step on that stick because he's afraid it'll snap and pop and alert some of his predators to his whereabouts. So that's the trick with the cage. Okay, so let's talk about the new trap that we're going to introduce. It is called a conibear trap or a body gripping trap. These traps come in three, well they come in multiple sizes, but the three most popular ones are the 110, the 220, and the 330. The one that we're going to focus on is the 220 conibear. It's the middle of the line guy. The 330 is more for beavers and it's a lot more powerful and the 110 is more for muskrats and squirrels and such like that. Okay, what consists of, to make it a body gripper trap, what are the parts? Okay, well first you have the frame, the springs, the dog, and the trigger. Now, before we go any further, let me say this. These traps should only be used in areas where you're not going, where your dog can't get in, your chickens can't get in, your cat, 
anything. These are a kill trap. They're lethal. Whatever goes through the square and sets the trigger off is going to die. That's just as blunt as I can put it. You also have to be careful. It can break your hands, your wrists, your forearms. There, there are pow powerful traps. And when you get up in the bigger ones with the 330, you really have to be careful because they can really severely, severely hurt you. But right now we're just gonna focus on the 220. So how do you set it? Okay, you have to squeeze your springs down and put your safety latches on. Now you can do this with either a pair of setting tongs, a rope. With the 220s, you should be able to do it. Just lean it on a table or a rock or a log, push down. You know, I can close them with my hands. Hook your safety latches on. Then you bring your trap up, squeeze it together, set your dog on your trigger. They have little notches where it goes in and it's set. Now, when we're talking about raccoon control, you can put this in a bucket. It's called a bucket set. Personally, on the homestead, I wouldn't even touch that because you stand too many possibilities of dogs, cats, whatnot getting in there. This, the main reason why I'm bringing this guy into the video is because if you have a raccoon that came through the tree line and jumped on the roof of your coop, and rip the hole, your cages and coon cuffs and footholds are useless because he's not traveling the ground to get to your chickens. He's coming through the trees. So now that he's ripped this hole the size of a basketball in your coop, you have to employ this trap. And what you do is you place it over the hole. Now you have to place it a certain way. You have to place it, place it with the dog facing you. Because if you place it over the hole with the dog facing away from you, then the nose of the dog will be in the hole. And when it fires off, it won't go completely out of the way and it'll stop the trap from firing completely. So then you'll either have an injured animal when you come back in the morning or you'll have a complete miss and you've just educated that coon and now he's going to be really hard to catch. So have the dog pointing at you. Face it down over the hole. Now you have to stabilize this trap so it can't do this number or this number. So my suggestion to you would be is to staple one side of your spring. Not both, just one side. Just right along down there. Like, just like that, over the hole. Boom. That should stabilize your trap. So that way it won't wiggle when he goes through it and the chances of you catching him right there behind the head increase by a factor of 100. So we've gone over the parts. Dog, trigger, springs, safety latch, body. We've talked about having to stabilize it. Talked about being able to move the arms. Now, one thing that you must do is it does come with a chain and an o-ring stretch it off to the side secure it somehow whether you take a big fence staple staple that puppy in because when this thing springs off it'll probably pull these staples out in same way with the depending on the weight of the coon his body weight of him bouncing up will pull them out you want a way to secure this so that way you're not looking all over your homestead for this trap and the coon or whatever it's in there. Because sometimes, unfortunately, if it's a really big coon, it may take a minute. Um, we've had, with the 330s, we've got some large beavers that it, they were wearing them like a Mr. T starter kit. We had the 330 around their neck, but we caught them by the foot and it ended up sent on a drowner, and that's how we got them. Um, so sometimes the larger ones of the species, it does take a few minutes for these to take effect. So that's why you anchor this down. Okay, so now that we've talked about the new trap, now let's talk about bait. 
So we know it's a coon. We know what trap we're going to use. So now it's time to talk baits and lures. And this is where it gets fun. I want you to remember one thing when you're thinking about your baits and your lures. Remember this. Remember how we said earlier that the raccoon is an opportunistic hunter? If it's there, he's going to go after it. So, with that in mind, you get to play around and experiment. I'm willing to bet that if you were to take a poll on 25 different trappers, you would get 25 different answers on what their favorite coon bait is and what they swear works every time. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go over a few of mine. Okay, so now I'm going to go over a few of my favorite types of baits. Now remember, these are just some of my favorite types. I'll also do other things. I'm not limited to what I'm about to share with you. And you shouldn't limit yourself either. For the coon cuff, I like the dried cat food. I use that more than I really use anything else. But I will also drop mini marshmallows in there. I will drop bits of honey bun in there. Hard boiled egg. I'll bust it up and drop that in there. I'll take a rubber crawfish, a fishing lure rubber crawfish. I'll drop that in there. It all depends on what the critters are showing me. Now, for your cage traps, I'll take a can of sardines, slide them in there. I'll take bigger marshmallows, throw them in there. I'll throw a hard boiled egg in there. The other thing that I will do with a cage trap is I'll take a golf ball, I'll wrap it in aluminum foil, and I'll toss it back there. Remember, he's curious by nature. So he's going to see that shiny golf ball in there, and he's just got to touch it. If I don't have a golf ball, I'll dangle a feather or some aluminum foil from the back of the cage. Now, warning, 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 warning. Do not be surprised if you use the golf ball or the feather or the dangling aluminum foil that if you come back to your trap in the morning and the coon is on the outside of the trap with his hand stuck in the trap, holding it, and won't let go. It's happened to me a couple of times. So be prepared for that. For that. And he won't let go for anything in the world. You can, you'll can you be able to walk right up to him and dispatch him. I don't know why. It's just he sees the shiny thing, he grabs it, he's got to have it. Now, for your foothold and your pocket sets, and your stuff like that, I make up my own bait, and that's something that we're going to do together. Okay, right now we're going to make a bait that I like to use for my pocket sets, my bucket sets with the Kana Bear. Sometimes I'll use it for the cage, and sometimes if I'm really desperate, I'll use it inside my coon cuff. But what you need is a can of oysters or clams, some chub mackerel or the salmon in a can, sardines, some anise ex extract, and some all-purpose flour. Now, oh, and you're also going to need a metal bowl, preferably a food processor that your wife or mom won't get mad at if you put all this stuff in there and chop it up, or you just do a really good job of cleaning it. Unfortunately, when we set up to make the video, our food processor wouldn't turn on, so we got to do it by hand. So we'll be using a fork, a spatula, and then you need a container to put your bait in once you're done. So, one of the first things you do is just get your, um, let's get your oysters. can open. Go ahead, let's go ahead and open up your mackerel or your salmon. And then go ahead and let's open up sardines. 
sardines. I like to just go ahead and open up all my stuff ahead of time. Now you want the oils and the juices to come out. Put them all in your mixing bowl. Okay. Then take your fork and you want to bust everything up. And so this is going to take a few minutes. So please enjoy the music and some random pictures of ducks. and the random pictures of ducks. <clears throat> now you want to add your all-purpose flour. Now there's not an exact amount of how much flour you need to add um, because each some unfortunately your cans of salmon and sardines and mackerel and stuff don't ever come with the same amount of liquid in them so you got to adjust it. Your goal is to make almost like a paste. So we'll mix this up. And you just keep adding the flour until you get your paste like substance. So as we're mixing this up, please enjoy random knock-knock jokes from my daughters. Knock-knock. Who's there? Nerf and Camp. Nerf and Camp. Moo! Rude. Knock-knock. <laughs> who's there? No bell. No bell who? No bell! That's why not! That's the whole reason of this knock-knock joke! Knock-knock. <laughs> who's there? Is really? Is really here? It's really hot out here! Open the door! Knock knock. Who's there? To. To who? No, it's to whom. Knock knock. Who's there? Banana. Banana who? Knock knock. Who's there? Banana. Banana who? Knock knock. Who's there? Banana. Banana who? Knock knock. Who's there? Orange. Orange who? Orange who did it? Say banana. <laughs> knock knock. Who's there? Control freak. <laughs> now you say control freak who? Okay. Can, can, can you do that? Repeat after me. Control oh, freak, freak who? Okay. Okay, you got that? You got that? Okay. Now say it, okay? Control freak who? Okay. Okay. Knock, knock. Who's there? Cargo. Cargo who? Go, go, beep, beep. Knock, knock. Who's there? Adelia. Adelia who? Adelia the cods and we can play go fish. How you know unless you open the door? <laughs> knock knock. Who's there? Moo. Moo who? How do you know unless you're a cow or an owl? <laughs> okay. Now when you get the paste made up, it should almost look like tuna, like a tuna fish sandwich, almost. Just doesn't taste the same. So you mix it all up. I probably got a little bit too much flour on this one because it came out a little bit too fast. So we're just gonna keep turning, getting a good thick mixture in here. Then you want to take your anise extract and pour a good portion in there. Then mix it up. Mix it up real good. Okay, and once you got it all mixed up, get your container, old Parmesan cheese containers, um, spaghetti sauce containers, a mason jar. I would say try to stick with plastic, um, so that way the jar doesn't bust. 
when you're either A, out on the trap line, or B, you got it stored in a refrigerator somewhere to keep it cold, because you do want to keep this semi-chilled so it don't go bad. Depends on how much you um, are going to use it. I use, um, don't tell on me, but I use my wife's canning jar funnel. Boop. And then you just spoon it in there. See, see how good and thick it is? That's what we want. Now, it smells bad. I ain't even gonna lie. I mean, depending on how much of the anise extract you put in there, you just, you just want to bloop. Um, you'll get a good strong whiff of it more than anything. And then you just feed it in here like such. Okay, so what you do is when you're out on the trap line or on your homestead, you just use a spoon full of this, either in your pocket hole or in your bucket. Just a good healthy spoonful is all really you need. Throw it in the back, in the back of it. And walk away. And then you're done. Come back in the morning. And now you've got a coon. So now what do you do? Okay, so you got a coon. Now what do you do? Well, you're going to be happy. I'm not going to go into a long, drawn out, what do you do with the catch the coon. I'm going to tell you go back and watch the possum video because we covered in detail there. What I am going to tell you to do is really before you do anything, call your state department of natural resources. Ask them if you're allowed to relocate it if you just feel like you have to. They may want you to. Your population of raccoons may be very low in your state and they may have a specific area they want you to take it to. They may tell you no, they need to euthanize it. They may come and confiscate the coon because in the counties surrounding yours or maybe even in your own county that you're unaware of there may be a rabies virus outbreak going on and they want to test the coon so either way give them guys a call first now if it's winter time after you make the call and you want to try kind of a new trade kind of thing skin him out flesh out his hide and then you'll be able to stretch him we have videos that we've done in the past and you can get to those right here now we are going to be updating those videos because we did get new tools along the way that does make those jobs a little bit easier and we'll be updating those videos this trapping season sometime after December 1st please just keep that in mind now also if it's the winter time raccoon meat is rather tasty you can eat him you can also take his fat from when th that you flesh off the hide and that you pull off the uh, meat. You can take it, throw it in a crock pot, render it down, and you can use that for candles and soap. Just some food for thought. Well, I hope this video has helped you guys out on your homestead with a predator control problem. This was Predator Control on the Homestead Episode 2. Next week... We will be filming episode 3, and it's going to be on mice and rats. So, please tune in for that one. Don't forget to check us out on the web at www.bigbearhomestead.com. And on our web, please visit our store. We have our wonderful t-shirts that you can purchase there, among some other things. I'm just really pushing the t-shirts. My wife is in charge of the Instagram that we're new to. I'm not allowed to touch it, so if you're on Instagram, please follow us, and you can leave a comment on there, something along the lines of, let Jason be on Instagram, maybe? I don't know, just some food for thought. Follow us on Twitter. If you're on Facebook, come on over, give us the old like. If you enjoyed this video, please like. If you have any questions, or you want to start the let Jason be on Instagram movement, Please comment below. 
Um, if you are new, this is the first time seeing one of our videos, please subscribe. And like always, have a nice day.